Good morning. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was just joking. That's what I saw. Yeah. Thank you. And behold, <laughs> your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that um, the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is the word of God. Boy, it's good to see everybody's face again. It really is. Dan, I like what you've done to the place. It's, it's just, this is nice. It's funny how the mind plays tricks on you, though. I just remember the pulpit is kind of... Anyway, um, you remember how sometimes I come up and I make mistakes in the service, you know? That was a magnificent reading. It was so well done, you know, from the New Testament. Would you like to hear the Old Testament passage I'm actually preaching from? This is from Ezekiel 34, so I'm sure that was my fault in communication. Um, so Ezekiel 34, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountain on every high hill. My sheep were scattered all over the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts since there was no shepherd. And because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. 
Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to the feeding. They're feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among the sheep that has been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited place of the country. I'll stop there. Oh, no, I won't. I'm going to keep going. Uh, I will, I'll start with verse 14. I'll feed them with good pasture on the mountain heights of Israel, be their grazing land. There they shall die, uh, lie down in good grazing land on a rich pasture. I shall feed them mount, uh, on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. That was a wonderful reading from the New Testament, and I had to decide either to make up an entirely new sermon or go ahead and, and read this. So we went, we went that way. I apologize. Um, last week, as part of the Advent study, uh, Dan preached on how in Christ, God came to us in our darkness. Darkness describing our inability to see things as they really are. Such darkness twists both uh, how we think and how we live. And we were encouraged with the gospel message that Jesus has the power through the cross and has earned the right to correct our thinking and turn our lifestyles toward what God intended. And today it's my privilege to preach an Advent message about another way in which God comes to us in Christ and one that's expressed by his role as a shepherd. Now, if you want to think of God's role as a shepherd, we probably would go first to Psalm 23. But... Jesus didn't go there. He went to Ezekiel 34. So we're going to do the same thing. This, this passage actually begins with bad shepherds who care nothing for the sheep there that, who are suffering. So let me, let, me put, let me put Ezekiel 34 in context and then show how Jesus ha interpreted this text, how he applied it to himself, and then how that, why that's crucial news to any of us who might be suffering as we approach Christmas. Because he comes into our suffering. What is Ezekiel 34 all about? God originally rescued Israel and called them to be his treasure when they were slaves in Egypt. They were as lost and they were as miserable as a people could get. In fact, their misery and their helplessness was one reason God actually chose them. Because God's salvation of Israel was the next step in a huge plan to save people of every nation. Save them from a slavery to sin and all the misery that it has brought us. That plan was designed to stretch over many, many generations. As the Lord used Israel's history as a canvas to paint a picture of how his salvation would work. And this plan would result in Christ's arrival. And then after that the expansion of his kingdom throughout the last days until his triumphant return to make all things new. Now, this plan would take many generations to develop. God's people needed to be guided. They needed to be sustained in a world that remains to this day broken while he accomplishes his plan. And so God appointed kings who will, and uh, as uh, you read here in Jeremiah, kings to serve as shepherds. Shepherd was a very common picture for kings in the ancient world, not just in Israel, but all over the ancient world. And the difference with Israel was that God said that he himself was king of his people, so Israel's human kings, or shepherds, were intended to represent him, represent his will, his righteousness, his mercy, his wisdom, his power, his fairness, his love, to sustain the people through all the hardships of human history. And some kings did well, but most of them did not. Over time, Israel's kings proved to be as selfish, as fearful, and as petty as any other rulers. They did not model the Lord in their character or their worship, 
or their faith. They did not manage society to promote God's justice or compassion. And as a result, the knowledge of God almost died in Israel. The people forgot who they were and how they were called because they lost sight of the one who called them. And that's why the Lord allowed them to become captives again, this time in Babylon, so he could teach them the basics of salvation one more time through a second exodus. And it was in that 70 years of captivity that Ezekiel preached. And his task was to explain why Israel had lost its integrity, their faith, why they had lost the integrity lost uh, from their faith. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Israel's kings hadn't been feeding the sheep. They'd been feeding off of the sheep. The kings hadn't represented God's loving care. They'd been ruling selfishly like any other ruler. Look at the things that they were supposed to do that they didn't do. You have not strengthened. You've, you've, you've not bound up. You've not, you've not sought. That kind of leadership does not represent the Lord. It cannot sustain God's people over the centuries until God's kingdom is fully established in eternal glory. Israel and Judah were therefore scattered into the nations that conquered them. They were scattered because their kings did not look after their needs. The Lord was Israel's king, but since their human kings did not represent God well, it was as if, it felt as if God's people had no shepherd. And so God spoke through Ezekiel. I'm against the shepherds. No longer would the Lord entrust the welfare of his people to such uncaring leaders. Zedekiah was king during the deportation to Babylon, and he was the last one. There would be no more. Well, not until something wonderful happened. God Almighty made a specific, explicit promise that he himself personally would come as his people's king or shepherd. Whatever that meant, it would not be the end of God's plan of salvation. There'd still be a whole world to reach. But no matter how many generations there are until all things are made new, no matter how many trials, no matter how much suffering we have to endure in this fallen world, God promised that the next king and shepherd of his people would be him. And he would come and he would fulfill that role personally. And he promised he would do that. And he promised he'd do it faithfully. Tell me, does this picture remind you of anyone in the Bible? In this case, the Sunday school answer is the correct answer. <laughs> it's Jesus, right? This is a picture of a Pakistani shepherd by photographer Bezit Zargar. And when you see a joyful shepherd, especially as he brings a lost sheep home, you automatically think of Jesus. Because unlike those who led God's people before him, this is how Jesus thinks about being a king. Now, as far as we know, Jesus never shepherded any sheep for a living. But he explained himself in John 10 by saying that he was the good shepherd. What good shepherd? Why that image? He was referring to the good shepherd promised in Ezekiel. And I want you to see that. It's important that you see that. That what he said about himself in John 10 was just paralleling Ezekiel 34 point by point. Let's push John 10 over to one side and put Ezekiel 34 next to it so we can see this. Like Ezekiel, Jesus begins in John 10 by talking about bad shepherds. The past kings of Israel who didn't care about God's flock but only used the, the flock selfishly. Then Jesus claims to be the fulfillment of God's promise to personally come and care for his people throughout their difficult journey. The Lord God said he would come to be his people's good shepherd and Jesus says, here I am. Jesus promised to do all the things that the bad shepherds did not do. He would address our every challenge and every hurt, and he would cause us to prosper no matter what happens along the way before we reach home. 
so we can taste the abundant life of the kingdom now, even before all things are made new. And Jesus even ends with the same reference that Ezekiel makes to one shepherd for all of God's people. Ezekiel prophesied that there would be a new David. There's more, there's more of the prophecy that I didn't read. But he prophesied that there would be a new David, a new son of David, and that coming Davidic kingdom was to encompass every nation. And Jesus says that he is that one shepherd for all of God's people. No matter where they come from, they'll all become one flock in him. In other words, he's the promised son of David. Now, we rightly give emphasis to how Jesus came to be our perfect priest whose sacrifice of himself gives us sinners free access to a holy God. That's how we can come to know him today and be cleansed and forgiven and saved for all time. But Jesus also came to be our perfect king. And just as he is our priest today who allows us to draw close to the Lord, he's also our king today so that the Lord may draw close to us and shepherd us on our long journey. You know, Jesus retired and he replaced all those former priests within a generation, you know, after the cross. And he's done the same thing. He's also replaced all former kings. Now, the Lord will never again entrust his people to anyone else to shepherd. Yes, of course, he calls some to be his assistants. And we call such men by the Greek word for shepherd, which is pastor. And it's the elder's privilege to assist Jesus by delivering his words and, and modeling his life. But history has shown that no man can do this the way God wants it done. No man is up to that challenge. So Jesus came to take up that role personally right now. For as long as it takes to complete the kingdom, he will use his assistance, yes. But we must never think for a moment that he has given over that role to anybody else. Through Ezekiel, the Lord said, I'm done with that. I'm going to shepherd my people myself so it's done right. And Jesus said, here I am, just as I promised. Jesus' role as priest was accomplished once for all time. But Jesus' role as king is still being accomplished today. Not for Old Testament Israel, of course, but now for what the New Testament calls the Israel of God, which is the church. But how does he do that? How does Jesus actively shepherd his people if his bodily now in paradise? He does it in two ways. First, he had everything that he wants to say to us that we need to know written down in the scriptures, in the Bible. And we recognize his voice as the Holy Spirit opens our eyes and our ears to understand and apply the Bible. And second, Jesus sends his Holy Spirit to connect him with every single believer, with each of us individually and all of us together as his body, functioning as his hands and his feet and his voice, etc. Through the scripture and through his spiritual presence in the entire body of believers, and we've already celebrated a fellowship today earlier in the service, Jesus himself is actually with us, not metaphorically, but truly. He is our shepherd. He's here right now. I know he is. And what that means, Christian, is that God, through Christ, is personally involved in every step of your life journey. No matter who else may be involved, Jesus is always involved. He's always guiding, he's always protecting, he's always caring for you the way a shepherd cares for his sheep. And that's what it means for Jesus to be our king. Now, if we want insight into what this means for us, we have only to look back into this prophecy, which Jesus used to explain himself. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I will care for them. I will give them abundant life. Let's take each example that we have here of, that God gave through Ezekiel and savor how the Lord God has promised to care for us. Promise to care for you. Promise to care for me. I will seek the lost. I will seek 
the lost, he says. You know, we tend to think of lost sheep as those who mistakenly wander over the next hill. Uh, no, such a sheep has strayed, but it's not lost. This is the Judean wilderness. I spent several hours there once as the sun was setting. This picture cannot communicate to you how desolate it was. The only sounds were the wind and the howling of packs of wild dogs. I did not want to stay there. This is what it means to be lost. To be lost means to stray not just over a hill. We'll get to that in a minute. The word translated here as lost is the word perishing. Perishing. Lost means so far from any flock that you're not part of any flock. Such a sheep is truly dead meat. No way a sheep's going to last even a night in the wilderness. When applied to a human being, lost means being utterly alone, utterly helpless. Paul described the idea in Ephesians 2, having no hope and without God in the world. As a young man, I came to realize that I was lost. That, that really surprised me because I was reasonably happy. I was, I was well-adjusted. <clears throat> I had a very bright future. But in the ways that mattered most to me, I was utterly alone. I had friends. I had a family. But in the universe, I was alone, utterly. No God, no real purpose or identity or meaning that made anything, nothing to look forward to ultimately, but death. Having no hope and without God in the world, that was me. I wonder if anybody here is lost. Lost. You know you're lost if nothing and no one can give you the meaning and the purpose and the belonging that you know you need and down deep you know you're supposed to have. You know, I heard that old statement about how we all have a God-shaped hole in our soul. That was just a hokey illustration to me until I realized I had a hole in my soul. And I didn't know whether it was God-shaped or not, but I did know that nothing I had ever tried to fill it with worked. How can I get unlost? We know what the gospel says about what Christ has done on the cross, what he did. How do I get, how do I get unlost? How does it happen? I can't. Lost sheep do not find shepherds. Ah, but good shepherds find lost sheep. When Jesus told parables about lost sheep, he was describing how salvation works. He says, I come to find you. I come to find you. As God works out his redemptive plan, Jesus personally comes after people. I don't mean coming after you like a hunter or something. That's, that's the bad, bad shepherds. Jesus personally comes into your wilderness, into your aloneness, to make you part of his flock so that one day he can bring you home safe. He doesn't track you down to scold you, to tell you how bad a sheep you... That's, that's bad. No. <laughs> forget that, forget that. No, no. He searches for you. He searches for you so he can bring you back into his fold with joy. Look at that shepherd's face. Look at the sheep's face. <laughs> That's what salvation feels like. This is how Jesus Christ described finding lost and perishing people. It's about him finding you. And he's got things for you to understand and things for you to believe. But this is what it feels like when he finds you because he has coming after you. When he finds you, it's personal. He will use the message of the Bible. He will use the members of his body, his church. But if you respond to any of that, it's because Jesus himself is there and he has found you. And you will sense his joy, his joy, as he brings you out of the wilderness. 
Jesus Christ is finding thousands of lost and perishing people today, beginning a journey with them that will never end. If you're lost, why couldn't you be one of them? The next three examples here deal with the day-to-day work of a shepherd. What God said he would do to keep us safe, help us taste the abundance of the king, kingdom to come. Even while his great plan of redemption is still unfolding, he's still, that's, that's still happening. It's not done yet. Okay? These are ways that Jesus himself works with each Christian every day. I will bring back the strayed. Strayed, not lost. These are sheep who already belong to the flock. They aren't lost in the wilderness, but they have strayed from the flock. They've strayed from the shepherd. They've gotten distracted by something or they've wandered away to check something out. In every case, a straying sheep is kind of experimenting with what life might be like, you know, if they weren't part of the flock. We all do it. So what does our good shepherd do? He brings us back. He brings us back. He doesn't have to seek for us in the wilderness. We're not lost. We're not even that far away. But we have strayed. We have disconnected from the flock. We're getting out of earshot of the shepherd. We aren't looking to where Jesus is leading us. We're experimenting with our own way. We think it's exciting, following our own whims. But boy, it's dangerous. The good shepherd brings us back. How he does that, that depends on the person, on the situation. But whatever he has to do to bring you back into the flock, participating in the flock, he will do. Because that's what a good shepherd does. I think I was was straying a bit over the last two years. It was a new time of life for me, but besides that, there was something called COVID. And I had to stay home and away from fellowship, and I was feeling, I was feeling disconnected. It wasn't, it wasn't a good place. And I don't think I'm the only one that felt that way. I wasn't focusing on the Lord Jesus as I had, but Jesus came after me, and he brought me back. I just happened to run into an old mentor of mine that you've already met this morning, his name anyway. Somebody, he was, he was the first, he was the first uh, model for me of a Christian man uh, who also loves science. Just what I needed. And I, came, I just came across him having breakfast in, in Stewart, having breakfast in, uh, at a restaurant. And I went over and said hi, and they said they met every week, and I kind of invited myself <laughs> to join them. And they're so gracious, they let me do that. And I cannot tell you how much that meant to me over the last two years. After that, I kind of ran across another old friend, another old mentor, actually, that I hadn't seen in almost 50 years. Still haven't seen him, but we spend three hours on the phone every other week, and it's been good for both of us. I don't think those things just happened. I am certain that Jesus brought them into my life because he is my shepherd. He used other people. He uses the word. I had to respond But he brought me back, and he brought me back personally. I know he did, and I love him for it. Some of you may have been straying a lot further than I did, and longer, and not just because of COVID. You might not realize it because you're still in services like this, and of course, I'm I'm delighted. But beyond the worship service, you're not really in fellowship, and maybe you haven't been for a long time. Maybe it's been a while since you've had a spiritual conversation or prayed with anyone. Maybe it's been a long time since you have extended yourself to help another Christian who's in need or allowed some other Christian help you. Maybe it's been a while since you spent any time in a group or one-to-one over coffee. Today, today Jesus is bringing back a lot of strays He's doing it all the time. It's what he does. He's a good shepherd. Today, many sheep are going to get healthier. The flock is going to get healthier uh, as they return. Why couldn't one of those strays be you? I'll bind up the injured. 
This word translated injured is literally broken. With sheep, that usually means, I think, a broken leg. Sheep with a broken leg may want to stay with the flock, but they can't. They are unable. They are too broken to keep up. Christians get broken too, don't we? Not just bruised and battered, but actually broken. Unable to stay with the fellowship of the church or even the fellowship of God. That's not because we're lazy or distracted. That's straying. We're broken when some part of us just doesn't work. Sometimes it's a broken body. That keeps us sidelined from activity, but more often it's a broken spirit. Many things can break a Christian. Too much grief, too much loss in so short a span of time. I've seen betrayal break people, abuse, war, and and hard, hard chains of addiction. Once I was broken, I was broken by a combination of betrayal and a profound, profound sense of failure at not being able to care for everyone as they needed. This church gave me six months leave My psychiatrist told me I would never return to the pastorate. But of course, all that he was able to tell me was that he couldn't bring me back to the pastorate. And in fact, I couldn't have returned myself. But there was someone. There was someone who could enable me to keep up with the flock again. My shepherd came to me in my brokenness, and he mended me. Broken sheep are not expected to mend themselves. That's what a good shepherd does. While he may use psychiatrists and all sorts of things as tools, it's Jesus who mends our spiritual brokenness. Jesus can fix anything. Oh, I'm dying for an illustration, but it's getting late. Um, Ask me after the service. Um, He can fix anything. He doesn't expect you to fix yourself. All you have to do is let him touch you. Let him love you. Follow his lead. Uh, That may mean getting some specific help. Uh, It may mean getting alone with him and opening your soul to him and learning to trust him again. Just follow his lead the way we always do. Take his word to heart. Let his spirit and the body minister to you. Today, Jesus is going to begin to fix thousands of broken Christians because that's what he does. Why couldn't one of them be you? And I was strengthened the week. To get a full sense of this idea, we need to go back to an earlier verse where we see it unpacked a little bit more. So let's squish verses 15 and 16 over and bring down verses 3 and 4 next to it so you can see that they're parallel. You see how they're parallel verses. It's talking about the same thing. What, what the bad shepherds didn't do, the good shepherd will do. But earlier version expanded the idea of and included a phrase, healing the sick. See that? Now, I do that because the words that are translated weak and sick are the same Hebrew word, okay? Same word. You translate it according to context. It's a broad, generic word, like an English word like ill. You can be physically ill, mentally ill, emotionally ill, spiritually ill, whatever. It's a generic term for affliction. That's what we have here. And I bring it up to show you that what you do with illness with ailing depends on the nature of the ailment. If your illness is more of a weakness, you need to be strengthened. If it's more of a sickness, you need to be healed. It depends on the nature of what ails you most. We can move just for a second to the New Testament. It talks about how Jesus went through all the cities and villages and proclaiming the gospel, healing every disease, every affliction, and then notice he brings up Ezekiel 34 again because he saw the crowd was harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So this is, again, another tie-in with Ezekiel. Here's another reference to Jesus as the good shepherd dealing with every kind of affliction, every kind, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional. Sometimes he would heal physically. Sometimes he would cast out demons. He would heal spiritually. Whatever he did would depend on what the affliction was. Once he he just said, your sins are forgiven. What was the individual most in need of at the time? Excuse me. 
you know, I could do that for effect. Anyway. This is what my shepherd does for me and what he does for you all the time. Afflictions don't mean that you're lost. They don't mean you're even straying. And, not, and afflictions don't mean that you're broken and you're unable to function. Afflictions simply hurt. We suffer afflictions every day. Kids having to homeschool, unreasonable expectations at work, tumors, crushed spinal nerves, physical ailments that doctors don't even understand. Afflictions are many and varied and they are frequent. They affect our body and they affect our soul. And our shepherd is right by our side to deal with each one according to what we most need at the time. Sometimes he heals me from my illness. I've, I've gotten better from a whole bunch of illnesses in my life because that's the only thing wrong with me and, and the illness is getting in the way of what he wants me to do. Other times, he strengthens me through the illness because the affliction has brought to light much more serious and destructive issues in my soul. If my soul is ailing, taking away the physical symptoms would not help me much. Our shepherd will always treat us the way we most need. He promised he would. And again, the only way we could miss out is just to resist letting him touch us at all because we're afraid. Today, Jesus is going to deal with millions of ills. As long as the world is broken, ills just keep on coming. But for those who are willing to trust him, he will powerfully treat our afflictions in life-changing ways, ways that genuinely make our lives more abundant. Why couldn't one of those whom Jesus masterfully treats today be you? And finally, I will feed them with justice. The list, uh, this list began with finding the lost, and Jesus used that image. He, remember, he talked about that, about uh, finding lost sheep as a way of talking about salvation. Uh, the middle part dealt with the day-to-day -day needs of our journey, and this last example of shepherding deals with our arrival home. When all, rights, all wrongs are righted and all things are made new, never to be broken again. Why do I say that? Because Jesus uses this section of the prophecy to speak of his return. I didn't read all the rest of it, but Ezekiel goes on to talk about how the shepherd will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, and it more, it develops that image of the sheep and goats and ringing a bell. Jesus specifically uses the last section of this prophecy to characterize final judgment, which he will execute for God's glory and for the eternal good of his flock. This Advent, let's remember the God, the God who entered our darkness, but let's also remember that this is the same God who entered our suffering. The one who came to be our perfect priest also came to be our perfect king and shepherd. The church's journey home is going to wind through every lost tribe and language and people and nation. It's going to be long and it's often hard. But when human shepherds could not provide all the help we need, the Lord promised to become our shepherd himself. In Jesus, that's exactly what he did. Pray with me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for keeping your promise. When no human shepherds could be found to sustain us while you build your kingdom, you promised to come yourself. And this Advent season, we thank you. We thank you for coming to us in Jesus. And we thank you with our whole hearts. Father, I would speak for any of us who found ourselves in that prophecy today. May your son shepherd me today. Find me, Lord, whether I'm lost or strayed or broken or ailing or losing hope of any justice because the journey is so long. Grant us grace to know right now that you have found us and we're not alone. And you will do whatever is needed to help us 
if we'll just let you touch us. Oh, Lord, let our joy in being found bring you praise. For Jesus' sake, amen.